tribunal please, Major Frank Wallace will now present the briefs and documents supporting the briefs in behalf of the phase of the case known as the Common Plan or Conspiracy up through 1939. Major Wallace. President, members of the tribunal, it will be my purpose to establish most of the material allegations of the indictment running from paragraph four on page three to subparagraph E on page six. The subjects involved are the aims of the Nazi party, their doctrinal techniques, their rise to power, and the consolidation of control over Germany between 1933 and 1939 in preparation for aggressive war. This story has already been sketched by the American chief prosecutor. Moreover, it is history beyond challenge by the defendants. For the most part, we rely upon the, the tribunal to take judicial notice of it. What we offer is merely illustrative material, including statements by the defendants and other Nazi leaders, laws, decrees, and the like. We do not need to rest upon captured documents or other <coughs> special sources, although some have been used. For the convenience of the court and defense counsel, the illustrative material has been put together in document books. And the arguments derived from them have been set out in trial briefs. I intend only to comment briefly on some of the materials and to summarize the main lines of the briefs. What is the charge in count one? The charge in count one is that the defendants with diverse other persons participated in the formulation or execution of a common plan or conspiracy to commit or which involved the commission of crimes against humanity, both within and without Germany, war crimes and crimes against peace. The charge is further that the instrument of cohesion among the defendants as well as an instrument for the execution of the purposes of the conspiracy was the Nazi party of which each defendant was a member or to which he became an adherent. The scope of the proof which I shall offer is first, that the Nazi party set for itself certain aims and objectives involving basically the acquisition of Liebesraum or living space.
of the gigantic number of people involved, the period of time covered, the magnitude and audacity of it, but because, unlike other criminal conspirators, these conspirators often boastfully proclaim to the world what they planned to do before they did it. As an illustration, Hitler, in his speech of 30 January 1941, said, My program was to abolish the Versailles Treaty. It is futile nonsense for the rest of the world to pretend today that I did not reveal this program until 1933 or 1935 on 1937, instead of listening to the foolish chatter of emigres, these gentlemen would have been wiser to read what I have written thousands of times. No human being has declared or recorded what he wanted more than I. Again, and again, I wrote these words, the abolition of the Treaty of Versailles. First, a brief reference to the history of the Nazi party. The court will no doubt recollect that the National Socialist Party had its origin in the German Labor Party, which was founded on the 5th of January, 1919, in Munich. It was this organization, which Hitler joined as seventh member, on the 12th of September, 1919. At a meeting of the German Labor Party held on the 24th of February, 1920, Hitler announced to the world the 25 theses that subsequently became known as the unalterable program of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. A few days later, on the 4th of March, 1920, the name of the German Labor Party was changed to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, frequently referred to as the NSDAP, or Nazi Party. It is under that name that the Nazi Party continued to exist until its dissolution after the collapse and unconditional surrender of Germany in 1945. The disagreements and intrigues within the party between Hitler's followers and those who opposed him were finally resolved on the 29th of July, 1921, when Hitler became first chairman and was invested with extraordinary powers. Hitler immediately reorganized the party and imposed upon it the Führer Prinzip, the leadership principle, of which you will hear more later. Thereafter, Hitler the Führer determined all questions and made all decisions for the party. The main objectives of the party, which are fastened upon the defendants and their co-conspirators, by reason of their membership in, or knowing adherence to the party, were openly and notoriously avowed. 
They were set out in the party program of 1920, were publicized in Mein Kampf and in Nazi literature generally, and were obvious from the continuous pattern of public action of the party from the date of its founding. Now, two consequences of importance in the trial of this case derive from the fact that the major objectives of the party were publicly and repeatedly proclaimed. First, the court may take judicial notice of them. Second, the defendants and their co-conspirators cannot be heard to deny or to assert that they were ignorant of them. The prosecution offers proof of the major objectives of the party and hence of the objectives of the conspiracy only to refresh or implement judicial recollection. The main objectives were, first, to overthrow the Treaty of Versailles and its restrictions on military armament and activity in Germany. Second, to acquire territories lost by Germany in World War I. Third, to acquire other territories inhabited by so-called racial Germans. And fourth, to acquire still further territories said to be needed as living space by the racial Germans so incorporated, all at the expense of neighboring and other countries. In speaking of the first aim, Hitler made an admission which applied equally to the other aims, namely that he had stated and written a thousand times or more that he demanded the abolition of the Versailles Treaty. These aims are fully documented in the evidence offered by the prosecution on this phase of the case. And it is not my purpose at this time to recite to the court numerous declarations made by the defendants and others with respect to these aims. <coughs> Moreover, these conspirators again and again publicly announced to the still unbelieving world that they propose to accomplish these objectives by any means found opportune, including illegal means and resort to threat of force, force and aggressive war. The use of force was distinctly sanctioned, in fact, guaranteed by official statements and directives of the conspirators, which made activism and aggressiveness a political quality obligatory for party members. As Hitler stated in Mein Kampf, what we needed and still need are not a hundred are 200 reckless conspirators, but a 100,000 
and a second hundred thousand fighters for our philosophy of life. And in 1929, Hitler stated, we confess further that we will tear anyone to pieces who would dare hinder us in this undertaking. Our rights will be protected only when the German Reich is again supported by the point of the German dagger. Hitler in 1934, addressing the party congress at Nuremberg, stated the duties of party members in the following terms. Only a part of the people will consist of really active fighters. It is they who were fighters of the National Socialist struggle. It is they who were fighters of the National Socialist revolution. Of them, more is demanded than of the millions among the rest of the population. For them, it is not sufficient to confess, I believe, but to swear, I fight. In proof of the fact that the party was committed to the use of any means, whether or not legal or honorable, it is only necessary to remind the court that the party virtually opened its public career by staging a revolution, the Munich Putsch of 1923. Now let us consider for a moment the doctrinal techniques of the common plan or conspiracy which are alleged in the indictment. To incite others to join in the common plan or conspiracy and as a means of securing for the Nazi conspirators the highest degree of control over the German community, they disseminated and exploited certain doctrines. The first of these was the master race doctrine, that persons of so-called German blood were a master race. This doctrine of racial supremacy was incorporated as point four in the party program, which provided only a member of the race can be a citizen. A member of the race can only be one who is of German blood without consideration of confession. Consequently, no Jew can be a member of the race. They outline this master race doctrine as a new religion, the faith of the blood, superseding in individual allegiance all other religions and institutions. The defendant Rosenberg and the defendant Stryker were particularly prominent in disseminating this doctrine. Much of the evidence to be offered in this case will illustrate the Nazi conspirators' continued espousal and exploitation of this master race doctrine. This doctrine had an, 
had an eliminatory purpose. Calling anything non-German or Jewish, and you have a clear right, indeed a duty, to cast it out. In fact, purges did not stop at so-called racial lines, but went far beyond. The second important doctrine, which permeates the entire conspiracy and is one of the important links in establishing the guilt of each of these defendants, is the doctrine or concept of the Fuhrer Prinzip or leadership principle. This doctrine permeated the Nazi party and all its formations and allied organizations and eventually permeated the Nazi state and all institutions and is of such importance that I would like to dwell upon it for a few moments and attempt to explain the concepts which it embraces. The Fuhrer Prinzip embodies two major political concepts. First, authoritarianism. Second, totalitarianism. Authoritarianism implies the following. All authority is concentrated at the top and is vested in one person only, the Fuhrer. It further implies that the Fuhrer is infallible as well as omnipotent. The party manual states, under the commandments of the National Socialists, the Fuhrer is always right. Also, there are no legal or political limits to the authority of the Fuhrer. Whatever authority is wielded by others is derived from the authority of the Fuhrer. Moreover, within the sphere of jurisdiction allotted to him, each appointee of the Fuhrer manipulates his powers in equally unrestricted fashion, subordinate only to the command of those above him. Each appointee owes unconditional obedience to the Fuhrer and to the superior party leaders in the hierarchy. Each political leader was sworn in yearly, according to the party manual, which will be introduced in evidence. The wording of the oath was as follows. I pledge eternal allegiance to Adolf Hitler. I pledge unconditional obedience to him and the Führers appointed by him. The party manual also provides that the political leader is inseparably tied to the ideology and the organization of the NSDAP. His oath only ends with his death or with his expulsion from the National Socialist community. As the defendant 
Hans Frank stated in one of his publications, leadership principle in the administration means always to replace decision by majority, by decision on the part of a specific person with clear jurisdiction and with sole responsibility to those above to entrust to his authority the realization of the decision to those below. And finally, the concept of authoritarianism contained in the Fuhrer Princip implies the authority of the Fuhrer extends into all spheres of public and private life. The second main concept of the Fuhrer Princip is totalitarianism, which implies the following. The authority of the Fuhrer, his appointees, and through them, of the party as a whole, extends into all spheres of public and private life. The party dominates the state. The party dominates the armed forces. The party dominates all individuals within the state. The party eliminates all institutions, groups, and individuals unwilling to accept the leadership of its Fuhrer. As the party manual states, only those organizations can lay claim to the institution of the leadership principle and to the national socialist meaning of the state and people in the national socialist meaning of the term which have been integrated into, supervised and formed by the party, and which in the future will continue to do so. The manual goes on to state, all others which conduct an organizational life of their own are to be rejected as outsiders and will either have to adjust themselves or disappear from public life. Illustrations of the Fuhrer Princip and its application to the party, the state, and allied organizations are fully set forth in the brief and accompanying documents which will be offered in evidence. The third doctrine or technique employed by the Nazi conspirators to make the German people amenable to their will and aims was the doctrine that war was a noble and necessary activity of Germans. The purpose of this doctrine was well expressed by Hitler in Mein Kampf when he said, and I quote, the question of restoration of German power is not a question of how to fabricate arms, but a question of how to create the spirit which makes a people capable of bearing arms. If this spirit dominates a people, the will finds a thousand ways to secure weapons. Hitler's writings and public utterances are replete with declarations rationalizing the use of force and glorifying war. The following is typical. 
when he said, Always before God and the world, the stronger has the right to carry through his will. History proves it. He who has no might has no use for might. As will be shown in subsequent proof, this doctrine of the glorification of war played a major part in the education of the German youth of the pre-war era. I now offer the documents which establish the aims of the Nazi party and their doctrinal techniques. I also have, for the assistance of the court and defense counsel, briefs which make the argument from these documents. I now direct your attention to the rise to power of the Nazi party. The first attempt to acquire political control was by force. In fact, at no time during this period did the party participate in any electoral campaigns nor did it see fit to collaborate with other political... Major Wallace, have you uh, got copies of these for defendants' counsel? In room 54, sir. Well, they will, want, they will be wanting to follow them now. I have... Mr. President, my remarks, which I'm proceeding, will cover an entirely different subject than the briefs before you. The briefs cover what I have already said, sir. Are you um, uh, depositing uh, a copy of these briefs for each of the defendants' counsel? <coughs> I am informed, Your Honor, please, that the same procedure has been followed with respect to these briefs as has been followed with respect to the documents. Namely, a total of six have been made available to the defendants in room 54. A what did you say? A total of six copies have been made available to the defendants in room 64. 54. Uh, if, uh, if Your Honor does not deem that number sufficient, I feel sure that I can give assurance on behalf of the Chief Prosecutor of the United States that before the close of the day, an ample supply of copies will be there for use. Well, the, the Tribunal thinks that uh, the uh, Defense Council should each have a copy of these briefs. Uh, that will be done, sir. <laughs> Members, one moment. Members of the Defense Council, you will understand that I have directed on behalf of the Tribunal that you should each of you have a copy of this brief. Anordnung und ich glaube, sie war auch notwendig. 
Da ich den Eindruck gehabt habe, dass keiner von uns gerade diese Dokumente gesehen hat, von denen jetzt die Rede ist. Ich, ich darf wohl auch annehmen, dass diese Dokumente der Verteidigung in deutscher Sprache vorgelegt werden, in deutscher Übersetzung. Ich darf wohl annehmen, dass diese Dokumente der Verteidigung in deutscher Übersetzung vorgelegt werden. Yes. Yes, Mr. Wallace. I now direct your attention to the rise to power of the Nazi Party. The 9th of November, 1923, warranted the end as well as the beginning of an era. On the 9th of November occurred the historical fact popularly known as the Hitler Putsch. During the night of November 8th to 9th, Hitler, supported by the SA under the defendant Goering, at a meeting in Munich, proclaimed the National Revolution and his dictatorship of Germany and announced himself as the Chancellor of the Reich. On the following morning, the duly constituted authorities of the state, after some bloodshed in Munich, put an end to this illegal attempt to seize the government. Hitler and some of his followers were arrested and tried and sentenced to imprisonment. The new era in the National Socialist Movement commences with Hitler's parole from prison in December 1924. With the return of its leader, the party took up its fight for power once again. The prohibitions invoked by the government against the Nazi party at the time of the Munich Putsch gradually were removed and Hitler, the Führer of the party, formally announced that in seeking to achieve its aims to overthrow the Weimar government, the party would resort only to legal means. A valid inference from these facts may well be suggested, namely, that the party's resort to legality was in real reality only a condition on which it was permitted to carry on its activities in a democratically organized state. But consistent with its professed resort to legality, the party now participated in the popular elections of the German people and generally took part in political activity at the same time, it engaged in feverish activity to expand the party membership, its organizational structure and activities. The SA and the SS recruited numerous new members. Hitler's Mein Kampf appeared in 1925. The Hitler Youth was founded. Newspapers were published. Among them, the Volkischer Beobachter, of which the defendant Rosenberg was editor, and Der Angriff, published by Goebbels, later the notorious minister of propaganda and public enlightenment. Meetings of other political parties were interfered with and broken up, and there was much street brawling. The results of the party's attempt to win political power made little headway for a number of years, despite the strenuous efforts exerted to that end. In 30 elections in which the National Socialists participated from 1925 to 1930 for seats in the Reichstag and in the Landage or provincial, or pro provincial diets, 
of the various German states. The Nazis received mandates in but 16 and gained no seats at all in 14 elections. The National Socialist vote in the 1927 elections did not exceed 4% of the total number of votes cast. The year 1929 marks the first modest success at the polls in the state of Thuringia. The Nazis received over 11% of the popular vote, elected six representatives out of a total of 53 to the Diet, and the defendant Frick became Minister of Interior of Thuringia, the first National Socialist chosen to ministerial rank. With such encouragement and proof of the success of its methods to win support, the Nazi party redoubled its traditional efforts by means of terror and coercion. These met with some rebuff on the part of the Reich in various German states. Prussia required its civil servants to terminate their membership in the party and forbade the wearing of brown shirts which were worn by the SA of the party. Baden likewise ruled against the wearing of brown shirts and Bavaria prohibited the wearing of uniforms by political organizations. New national socialist writings appeared in Germany. The new National Socialist Monthly appeared under the editorship, editorship of the defendant Rosenberg and shortly thereafter in June 1930 Rosenberg's Myth of the 20th Century was published. Against this background President von Hindenburg having meanwhile dissolved the Reichstag when Chancellor Bruning failed to obtain a vote of confidence, Germany moved to the polls once more on the 14th of September, 1930. By this election, their representation in the Reichstag was increased from 12 seats to 107 seats out of a total of 577. The new Reichstag met and 107 Nazis marched into the session dressed in brown shirts. Rowdy opposition at once developed, intent on causing the fall of the Bruning cabinet. Taking advantage of the issues caused by the then prevailing general economic distress, the Nazis sought a vote of non-confidence and dissolution of the Reichstag. Failing in these obstructionary tactics, the Nazis walked out on the Reichstag. With 107 members in the Reichstag, the Nazi propaganda increased in violence. The obstruction by the Nazi deputies of the Reichstag continued with the same pattern of conduct. Repeatedly, motions of non-confidence in Bruning and for dissolution of the Reichstag were offered and were lost. And after every failure, the Nazi members stopped out of the chamber anew. By the spring of 1932, Bruning's position became untenable and the defendant von Papen was appointed chancellor. The Reichstag was dissolved and new elections held in which the Nazis increased the number of their seats to 230 out of a total of 608. The Nazi party had now become a strong party in Germany. 
but it had failed to become the majority party. The obstructive tactics of the Nazi deputies in the Reichstag continued, and by the fall of 1932, von Papen's government was no longer able to continue. President von Hindenburg again dissolved the Reichstag, actually decreased, and in the new elections of November, the Nazi representation in the Reichstag actually decreased to 196 seats. The short-lived von Schleicher government then came into being. It was the 3rd of December, 1932, and by the end of January 1903, it went out of existence. With the support of the Nationalist Party under Hugenberg and other political assistants, Hitler became Chancellor of Germany by designation of von Hindenburg. That is the end of the prologue, as it were, to the dramatic and sinister story that will be developed by the prosecution in the course of this trial. Let it be noted here, however, and remembered as the story of the misdeeds and crimes of these defendants and their fellow conspirators are exposed, that at no time in the course of their alleged legal efforts to gain possession of the state did the conspirators represent a majority of the people. Now it is commonly said that the Nazi conspirators seized control when Hitler became Chancellor of the German Republic on 30 January 1930. It may be more truly said that they seized control upon securing the passage of the law for the protection of the people and the state on the 24th of March 1933. The steps leading to this actual seizure of power are worthy of recital. The Nazi conspirators were fully cognizant of their lack of control over the legislative powers of the Republic. They needed, if they were to carry out the first steps of their grand conspiracy under the cloak of law, an enabling act which would vest supreme legislative power in Hitler's cabinet, free from all restraints of the Weimar Constitution. Such an enabling act, however, required a change in the Constitution, which in turn required two-thirds of the regular members of the Reichstag to be present, and at least two-thirds of the votes of those present. The timetable of events leading up to the passage of this enabling act, known as the law for the protection of the people and the state, is as follows. On January 30th, 1933, Hitler held his first cabinet meeting. And we have the original minutes of that meeting, which will be offered in evidence. The defendants, von Papen, von Neurath, Frick, Goring, and Funk were present. According to the minutes of this meeting, Hitler pointed out that the adjournment of the Reichstag would be impossible without the collaboration of the Center Party. He went on to say, we might, however, consider suppressing the Communist Party to eliminate its votes in the Reichstag and by this measure achieve a majority in the Reichstag. He expressed fear, however, 
that this might result in a general strike. The right minister of economy, according to these official minutes, stated that in his opinion, it was impossible to avoid the suppression of the Communist Party of Germany, for if that were not done, they could not achieve a majority in the Reichstag, certainly not a majority of two-thirds, that after the suppression of the Communist Party, the passage of an enabling act through the Reichstag would be possible. The defendant Frick suggested that it would be best initially to request an enabling law for the, from the Reichstag. At this meeting, Hitler agreed to contact representatives on the center party the next morning to see what could be done by way of making a deal with them. The next event in this timetable was the Reichstag fire on the 28th of February, 1933. Taking advantage of the uncertainty and unrest created by the Reichstag fire and the disturbances being created by the SA, the provisions of the Weimar Constitution guaranteeing personal freedom <clears throat> and other personal liberties was suspended by a decree of the Reich President on February 28, 1933. Then on the 5th of March, 1933, elections to the Reichstag were held. The Nazis acquired 288 seats out of a total of 647. On the 15th of March, 1933, Another meeting of the Reich's cabinet was held, and we also have the original official minutes of that meeting, which bears the initials opposite their names of the defendants who were present at that meeting, signifying that they had read. I contend that it's a reasonable inference to state that it signifies that they read these minutes and approve them. The following defendants were present at this meeting. Von Papen, Von Neurath, Frick, Goring, and Funk. At this meeting, according to these official minutes, Hitler stated that the putting over of the enabling act in the Reichstag by a two-thirds vote would, in his opinion, meet with no opposition. The defendant Frick pointed out that the Reichstag had to ratify the Enabling Act with a constitutional majority within three days, and that the center party had not expressed itself negatively. He went on to say that the defendant, the Enabling Act, would have to be broadly conceived in a manner to allow for deviation from the provisions of the Constitution of the Reich. He further stated that as far as the constitutional requirement of a two-thirds majority was concerned, <clears throat> a total of 432 delegates would have to be present for the ratification of the Enabling Act. The defendant Goring expressed his convictions at this meeting that the Enabling Act would be ratified with the required two-thirds vote, for if necessary, the majority could be obtained by refusing admittance to the Reichstag of some social democrats. On the 20th of March, another cabinet meeting was held. And we also have the official original records of this meeting, which will be offered in evidence. The defendants Frick, von Papen, von Neurath, Goring, and Funk were present. The proposed enabling act was again the subject of a discussion. Hitler reported on the conference he had completed with representatives 
of the center party. The defendant, Nurat, proposed a note concerning the arrangement to be agreed to by the representatives of the center party. The defendant, Frick, expounded to the meeting the contents of the draft of the proposed law and further stated that changes in the standing orders or rules of the Reichstag were also necessary, that an explicit rule must be made that unexcused absent delegates be considered present. And if that was done, it would probably be possible to ratify the Enabling Act on the following Thursday in all three readings. It is interesting to note <clears throat> that among the things recorded in the official minutes of this cabinet meeting was the defendant Goring's announcement that he had ordered SA troops on the Polish border to be cautious and not to show themselves in uniform and that the defendant Nurat recommended also that the SA be cautious, especially in Danzig. In addition, the defendant Nurat pointed out that communists in SA uniforms were being caught continuously. These stool pigeons had to be hanged. Justice had to find means and ways to make possible such punishment for communist stool pigeons, according to the defendant, Nurat. On the 14th of March, 1933, the defendant Frick announced, and I quote, when the Reichstag meets the 21st of March, the communists will be prevented by urgent labor elsewhere for participation in the session. In concentration camps, they will be re-educated for productive work. We will know how to render harmless permanently subhumans who don't want to be re-educated. During this period, Taking advantage of the decree suspending constitutional guarantees of freedom, a large number of communists, including party officials and Reichstag deputies, and a smaller number of social democratic officials and deputies, were placed in protective custody. On the 23rd of March, 1933, in urging the passage of this enabling act, Hitler stated before the Reichstag, it is up to you gentlemen to make the decision now. It will be either peace or war. On the 24th of March, 1933, only 535 out of the regular 647 deputies of the Reichstag were present. The absence of some was unexcused. They were in protective custody in concentration camps. Subject to the full weight of the Nazi pressure and terror, the Reichstag passed an enabling act known as the law for the protection of the people and state with a vote of 441 in favor. This law marks the real seizure of political control by the conspirators. For Article I provided that Reich laws can be enacted by the Reich cabinet. Article II provided the national laws enacted by the Reich cabinet may deviate from the Constitution. Article III provided National laws enacted by the Reich cabinet are prepared by the Chancellor and published in the Reich Gazette's block. 
Article 4 provided treaties of the rights with foreign states which concern matters of national legislation do not require the consent of the parties participating in legislation. The Reich cabinet is empowered to issue the necessary provisions for the execution of these treaties. Thus, the Nazis acquired full political control, completely unrestrained by any provisions of the Weimar Constitution. I now offer the brief and accompanying Pardon me, I now offer the documents which establish the facts which I have just stated. And I also present for assistance of the court and defense counsel the brief covering this portion of the case. I wish to speak to uh, Major Wallace. Yes. Would it be possible uh, to let the... Yeah. He's standing away from uh, you, you must go to the microphone. The, the, the drum, yes. Would it... Oh, he didn't have that on. Uh, would, would it be possible for the prosecution to let defendants' counsel have at least one copy between each two of them here in court. If not today, then tomorrow. Uh, if the tribunal please, there has been some misunderstanding. Uh, the briefs were uh, delivered to the defendant's document room. We have sent for some of them and they should be here shortly. However, sir, in all fairness, there, the briefs themselves are not in the German language because we had intended to take the trial brief and the lawyer follow it over the translating system. And thus, when it was finished, it would be translated into all languages. However, in order to shorten the proceeding, Major Wallace has made a summary, and he is giving the summary and will 
offer the documents in evidence and later the briefs as an aid to the tribunal and to defense counsel. And unfortunately, in the rush of time, they've been put down in the def uh, defendant's document room and we've sent for some of them. We understand also, if the tribunal please, that Dr. Kempner approached some of the distinguished counsel for the defense and learned that a great many of them not only speak English, but understand it when they read it, and to save the tremendous physical burden on facilities, the briefs have not as yet been translated into German. And if there is objection, the only thing we can do is to withhold them at this time. But we understood it would be agreeable to pass them to them in English and that's what we propose to do at the present moment and have German-speaking officers in the document room who will translate for any of them who may not be able to read German. Having acquired full political control, the Nazi conspirators now proceeded to consolidate this power. And at this point, I would like to impress upon the tribunal once again that with the exception of a very few documents, the subject matter of my remarks are within the purview of judicial notice of the court. It's a matter of history, well known to these defendants and their counsel. The first step in the consolidation of this power, may it please the court, at the moment of recess, I was referring to the law which was passed on 1 December 1933 for securing the unity of party and state. Article six of that law provides the public authorities have to grant legal and administrative assistance to the offices of the party and the SA, which are entrusted with the execution of the jurisdiction of the party and SA. Article 8 provided the Reich Chancellor as Führer of the National Socialist German Workers' Party and as the Supreme Commander of the SA, will issue the regulations necessary for the execution and augmentation of this law, particularly with respect to the organization and procedure of the jurisdiction of the party and SA. Thus, by this law, the Nazi party became a paragovernmental organization in Germany. The further merger of the party and state occurred on the death of Hindenburg. Instead of holding an election to fill the office of president, the merger of the offices of president and chancellor in the person of Hitler was accomplished by the law of 1 August 1934, signed by the entire Reich cabinet. One of the significant consequences of this law was to give Hitler the supreme command of the German armed forces always a perquisite of the presidency. And every soldier was immediately required to take an oath of loyalty and unconditional obedience to Hitler. On 4 February 1938, Hitler issued a decree 
which stated in part, and I quote from document number 1915 PS, which will be offered in the document book at the close of my remarks, as follows. From now on, I take over directly the command of the whole armed forces. As a further step in the consolidation of their political control, the Nazi conspirators reduced national elections to mere formalities, devoid of the element of freedom of choice. Elections, properly speaking, could not take place under the Nazi system. In the first place, the basic doctrine of the Fuhrer Prinzip dictated that all subordinates must be appointed by their superior in the government hierarchy. Although it had already become the practice in 1938 it was specifically provided by law that only one list of candidates was to be submitted to the people. By the end of this pre-war period, little of substance remained in the election law. The majority of the substantive provisions had become obsolete. By a series of laws and decrees, the Nazi conspirators reduced the powers of regional and local governments and substantially transformed them into territorial subdivisions of the Reich government. With the abolition of representative assemblies and elective officials in the Landa and the municipalities, regional and local elections ceased to exist. On 31 January 1934, the last vestige of land independence was destroyed by the law for the reconstruction of the Reich. The defendant Frick, Minister of the Interior throughout this period, has written of this law for the reconstruction of the Reich as follows. The reconstruction law abolished the sovereign rights and executive powers of the Landa and made the Reich the sole bearer of the rights of sovereignty. The supreme powers of the Landa do not exist any longer. The natural result of this was the subordination of the land governments to the Reich government and the land ministers to the corresponding Reich ministers. On 30 January 1934, the German Reich became one state. <coughs> End of quotation. Another step taken by the Nazi conspirators in consolidating their political power was the purge of civil servants on racial and political grounds and their replacement by party members and supporters. This purge was accomplished through a series of Nazi laws and decrees. The first was on 7 April 1933, entitled Law for the Restoration of the Professional Civil Service. Article 3 of the law applied the Nazi blood and master race theories in providing that officials who were not of Aryan descent were to be retired. The political purge provision of the law is contained in Article 4, and I quote, officials who, because of their previous political activities, do not offer security that they will assert themselves for the national state without reservations may be dismissed. The effect of this law and the decrees and regulations issued thereunder was to fill every responsible position 
in the government with a Nazi and to prevent the appointment of any applicant opposed or suspected of being opposed to the Nazi program and policy. Even the judiciary did not escape the purge of the Nazi conspirators. All judges who failed to fulfill the racial and political requirements of the conspirators were quickly removed. In addition, the Nazis set up a new system of special criminal courts, independent of the regular judiciary and directly subservient to the party program. Moreover, the Nazi controlled all judges through special directives and orders from the central government. Their aim being, as expressed by one Garland, one of the leading Nazi lawyers of that time, to make the word terrorization in the penal law respectable again. As their control was consolidated, the conspirators greatly enlarged existing state and party organizations and established an elaborate network of new formations and agencies. The party spread octopus-like throughout all of Germany. This process of growth was summed up late in 1937 in an official statement of the party chancellery as follows. In order to control the whole German nation in all spheres of life, and I repeat, in order to control the whole German nation in all spheres of life, the NSDAP, after assuming power, set up under its leadership the new party formations and affiliated organizations. At this point, I would like to offer to the court the document book which contains the laws and quotations which I have referred to in this part of my presentation, together with the briefs covering this point of it, I would now like to direct the tribunal's attention to some case histories in the consolidation of control by the conspirators. The first case history in the consolidation of the Nazi conspirators' control of Germany is the destruction of the free trade unions and the obtaining of control over the product productive labor capacity of the German nation. The position of organized labor in Germany at the time of the Nazi seizure of power, the obstacles it afforded to the Nazi plans, the speed with which they were destroyed, the terror and maltreatment ranging from assaults to murder of union leaders, were fully outlined in the opening address of the Chief Prosecutor of the United States and are fully set forth in the document book which I will present to the court on this phase of the case. The result 
achieved by the Nazi conspirators is best expressed in the words of Robert Ly. Ly's confidence in the Nazis' effective control over the productive labor capacity of Germany in peace or in war was declared as early as 1936 to the Nuremberg Party Congress. I refer to document 2283 PS, which is included in the document book, which will be presented on this phase of the case. He stated, the idea of the factory troops is making good progress in the plants. And I am able to report to you, my Fuhrer, that security and peace in the factories has been guaranteed not only in normal times, but also in times of the most serious crisis. Disturbances such as the munition strikes of the traitors Ebert and Confederates are out of the question. National Socialism has conquered the factories. Factory troops are the National Socialist shock troops within the factory. And their motto is, the Fuhrer is always right. At this time, I would like to offer to the court the document book containing the documents on this phase of the case, namely the destruction of labor unions and the gaining of control of all productive labor in Germany, together with the brief on that subject. And at the same time, and at the same time, if it please the court, uh, I would like to offer the document book concerning the consolidation of control with respect to the utilization and molding of political machinery, which are the laws and decrees which I referred to just prior to my discussion of the destruction of labor unions. I would now direct your attention to the second case history in the consolidation of control. The Nazi conspirators early realized 
that the influence of the Christian churches in Germany was an obstacle to their complete domination of the German people and contra to their master race dogma. As the defendant Martin Bormann stated in a secret decree of the party chancery, signed by him and distributed to all gall lighters on 7 June 1941, which is identified as document number D75 and will be included in the document book which will be presented to the court. He stated as follows. More and more must the people be separated from the churches and their organizations and pastors. Not until this has happened does the state leadership have influence on the individual citizens. Accordingly, the Nazi conspirators seeking to subvert the influence of the churches over the people of Germany, proceeded to attempt to eliminate these churches. First, by promoting beliefs and practices incompatible with Christian teachings. Second, by persecuting priests, clergy, and members of monastic orders. This persecution as the documentary evidence will show, ran the gauntlet of insults and indignities, physical assault, confinement to concentration camps, and murder. Third, by the confiscation of church properties. Fourth, by suppressing religious publications. and fifth, by the suppression of religious organizations. And in addition, they suppressed religious education. This is illustrated by the secret decree of the party chancery, which I just referred to in document D-75, when the defendant Bormann stated no human being would know anything of Christianity if it had not been drilled into him in his childhood by his pastors. The so-called dear God in no wise gives knowledge of his existence to young people in advance. But in an astonishing manner, in spite of his omnipotence, leaves this to the efforts of the pastors. If, therefore, in the future our youth learns nothing more of this Christianity, whose doctrines are far below ours, Christianity will disappear by itself At a subsequent stage in these proceedings, additional documentary evidence of the acts of the conspirators in their attempt to subvert the influence of the Christian churches will be offered. At this time, I offer the document book in support of this phase of the case together with the accompanying brief. <clears throat> we now come to the what might be called the third case history, the persecution 
of the Jews. The Nazi conspirators adopted and publicized a program of ruthless persecution of Jews. It is not our purpose at this time to present to the court a full and complete story in all its sickening details of the Nazi conspirators' plans and acts for the elimination and liquidation of the Jewish population of Europe. This will be done in due course at a subsequent stage of these proceedings. But it is our purpose at this time to bring before you as one of the elements in the Nazi scheme for the consolidation of their control of Germany, the action which was planned and taken with respect to the Jews within Germany during the pre-war period. As a means of implementing, implementing their master race policy, and as a means of rallying otherwise discordant elements behind the Nazi banner, the conspirators adopted and publicized a program of relentless persecution of Jews. This program was contained in the official, unalterable 25 points of the Nazi party, of which six were devoted to the master race doctrine. The defendants Goring, Hess, Rosenberg, Frank, Frick, Stryker, Funk, Chirac, Bormann, and others all took prominent parts in publicizing this program. Upon the Nazis coming into power, this party program became the official state program. The first organized act was the boycott of Jewish enterprises on 1 April, 1933. The defendant Stryker, in a signed statement, admits that he was in charge of this program only for one day. We, of course, reserve the right to show additional evidence with respect to that fact. The Nazi conspirators then embarked upon a legislative program which was gradual and which dates from 7 April 1933 until September 1935. During this period, a series of laws were passed removing the Jews from civil service, from the professions, and from the schools and military service. It was clear, however, that the Nazi conspirators had a far more ambitious program for the Jewish problem and only put off its realization for reasons of expediency. After the usual propaganda barrage in which the speeches and writings of the defendant Stryker were most prominent, the Nazi conspirators initiated the second, second period of anti-Jewish legislation, namely from 15 September 1935 to September 1938. In this period, the infamous Nuremberg Laws were passed, depriving the Jews of their rights as citizens, forbidding them to marry Aryans, and eliminating them from additional professions. In the autumn of 1938, the Nazi conspirators began to put into effect a program of complete elimination of the Jews from German life. The measures taken were partly presented as a retaliation against world Jewry in connection with the killing of a German embassy official in Paris. Unlike the boycott action in April 1933, when care was taken to avoid extensive violence, an allegedly spontaneous pogrom was staged and carried out all over Germany. 
the legislative measures which followed were discussed and approved in their final form at a meeting on 12 November 1938 under the chairmanship of the defendant Goering with the participation of the defendants Frick and Funk and others. I refer to document 1816 PS, which will appear in the document book to be offered. The meeting was called following Hitler's orders, requesting that the Jewish question be now, once and for all, coordinated and solved one way or the other. The participants agreed on measures to be taken for the elimination of the Jew from German economy. The laws issued in this period were signed mostly by the defendant Goering in his capacity as deputy for the four-year plan and were thus strictly connected with the consolidation of control of the German economy and preparation for aggressive war. These laws obliged all German Jews to pay a collective fine of one billion Reichsmark, barred the Jews from trades and crafts, limited movement of Jews to certain localities and hours, limited the time for the sale or liquidation of Jewish enterprises, forced Jews to deposit shares and securities held by them, forbade the sale or acquisition of gold or precious stones by a Jew, granted landlords the right to give notice to Jewish tenants before legal expiration of the leases, and forced all Jews over six years of age to wear the Star of David. In the final period, of the anti-Jewish crusade of the Nazi conspirators within Germany, very few legislative measures were passed. The Jews were just delivered to the SS, Gestapo, and the various extermination staffs. The last law dealing with Jews in Germany put them entirely outside the law and ordered the confiscation by the state of the property of dead Jews. This law was a re weak reflection of a factual situation already in existence. As Dr. Stuckett, assistant to the defendant Frick, stated at the time, the aim of the racial legislation may be regarded as already achieved, and consequently, the racial legislation as essentially closed. It led to the temporary solution of the Jewish problem and at the same time prepared for the final solution. Many regulations will lose their practical importance as Germany approaches the achievement of the final goal in the Jewish problem. Hitler, on January 30th, 1939, in a speech before the Reichstag, made the following prophecy. The result of a war will be the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. I will leave to others in this case the task of presenting to the court the evidence as to how well that prophecy was fulfilled. I would now offer to the court the document book which contains the laws referred to with respect to the persecution of the Jews 
and the brief outlining that subject.